everyone and welcome to Biorad's latest podcast on the importance of specific in vitro assays for the development of biosimilars. Here we are at the Biorad headquarters and visiting us from our Biorad Antibodies Division in Oxford is Amanda Turner. Welcome Amanda. Hi Laura, pleasure to be here. So we've been hearing a lot of buzz about biosimilars and how they're going to open up expensive biological drugs like antibodies such as Humira to more patients, you know, especially those in developing countries. Yes, modern healthcare innovations such as monoclonal antibody drugs are very expensive. And as the need for these therapies grows, governments and insurers, especially in developing countries, are demanding less costly alternatives. And that will enable them to bring these medicines to patients. And the way biosimilars fit in, they're faster to develop than their counterpart reference product, and the process costs less. For example, $100 million for a biosimilar versus over $2 billion to develop an original product. Wow, that's a significant savings. Right, and this is primarily because there's no initial discovery phase, and the phase two clinical trials are not required. And then we see the reduction in the overall cost passed on to the payer. Mm -hmm. And this could be in terms of about a 10 or 25 percent decrease in price compared to the original. That's really important. So, you know, with all of that being said, how many biosimilars are there at the moment? Well, there are about 76, I think, in regulated regions such as the USA and Europe, and another 448 in other countries such as China and India. But in development, there are over 220 monoclonal antibody drug biosimilars at the moment. Wow. And what types of disease are they they kind of focused on or are they for treatment for? Yes, it's a wide range, but the monoclonal antibody drug biosimilars, for example, are focused on cancer and autoimmune diseases such as arthritis or psoriasis. Got it. So can you tell me more about the important steps in the characterization and the bioanalysis of a monoclonal antibody biosimilar? Yeah, so a biosimilar, as it says in the name, has to be really highly similar to the biological reference product, the original drug. You can have minor differences in clinically inactive components, but there mustn't be any clinically meaningful differences between the biosimilar and the original drug in terms of the safety, the purity, and the potency. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So it's important that biosimilar is no worse, but also it can't be any better either. Oh. So although regulatory processes vary between countries, all require the use of a single reference product for these comparisons with the biosimilar. And so a regulator, such as the FDA, will look at the totality of evidence that is given to them in support of a biosimilar approval. So that's all the bioanalytical data on the structural and functional characteristics of the molecule, plus any non-clinical and clinical data as well. And in the clinical trials, it's the assessment of immunogenicity that's really important because this can alter the pharmacokinetics of a drug, but also it can promote the anti-drug antibodies forming. And that can seriously affect the efficacy of the drug, but also cause perhaps really serious side effects. Oh. And lastly, because the clinical trials for biosimilars require fewer patients than for the original drug, it's really important that even after the biosimilar is launched, that there's a continual assessment of the immunogenicity and the side effects. So you mentioned that the bioanalysis of biosimilars is a key part in their development and that this data is used to obtain approval from regulatory agencies. But but what are the types of assays that are actually being carried out? Right, so the bioanalysis is done by mass spec, but also ligand binding assays. And those include pharmacokinetic assays, or PK assays, pharmacodynamic assays, and immunogenicity assessment, also called anti-drug antibody assays. And these all form an essential part of the bioanalysis of a biosimilar to compare it to the reference product. So can we go a little bit deeper on, you know, how a PK assay is developed or or what it is, how, how it works? Sure. So a PK assay is used to determine how the body affects the drug from the time it's given until it's eliminated from the subject. But it's tricky because for a human or humanized monoclonal antibody drug, finding out how much of the drug is present in the serum at any given time is really difficult. Mm. So if you think about it, natural IgG1 in human serum is at a concentration of about 10 mg per mil. Okay. But the drug is given at much lower levels. So the task is to detect the drug specifically within a millionfold excess of similar molecules. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Mm -hmm. There are several options for PK assays using the drug target and different types of antibodies. 
So for PK assays to detect monoclonal antibody drugs, one of the preferred assay types is a PK bridging ELISA. And here, the monoclonal antibody drug is captured with specialised, highly specific antibodies called anti-idiotypic antibodies, or anti-ids for short. I can see why they're called anti-ids for short. Anti-idiotypic antibody. OK, that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. <laughs> um, so, you know, how, you know, what's, what is an anti-idiotypic antibody? Good question. So the whole of the variable part of a monoclonal antibody drug, including the paratope, where the drug target binds, is called the idiotype. And the unique regions are called idiotopes. And these idiotopes are the only parts of the antibody drug that are different to all the other IgG in the patient serum. Oh, OK. So an anti-idiotypic antibody can be made specifically to target the idiotope of a monoclonal antibody drug. OK, that's a bit of a tongue, twist, tongue twister, <laughs> yeah. but I, I think I get it now. <laughs> right. So these specially designed antibodies are essential tools for the PK bridging ELISA and they act as highly specific capture and detection reagents. So how do you actually make an anti-idiotypic antibody? Great. You've got it now, Laura. Well done. <laughs> so traditional antibody generation methods that rely on the immunisation of animals to generate polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies can be used to generate antibodies against biologics, such as biosimilars. Got it. However, the success rate for generating these highly specialised anti-idiotypic antibodies is much higher when more sophisticated antibody generation technology is used. And, for example, this mm -hmm. could be generation of recombinant monoclonal antibodies in vitro from an antibody library using phage display. Got it. So this type of platform can be used with specialised selection methods that get you a high affinity inhibitory or non-inhibitory antibody and even specialised antibodies that detect the drug only when in combination with its target. And this gives the bioanalyst lots more flexibility in the design of their PK assays. And the in vitro antibody generation is much faster than traditional methods. And, of course, you've got the sequence of the antibody. So you've got a long term security of supply. So I'm guessing that since, you know, these are key experiments in the development of biosimilars, that researchers that are using these have specific requirements for, you know, putting them into their assays. You're absolutely right. These antibodies are critical reagents for bioanalytical assays. So it's really important that they meet the high quality standards consistently. For example, high purity, long term stability and reproducibility between batches is absolutely essential, along with a continuous supply over the lifetime of this whole clinical development of the biosimilar, which could be five to seven years. That's great. So it seems like the bioanalytical scientist has some great tools available to them to assist in the development of these biosimilars. You know, but fingers crossed, right? Let's hope that all of this work really results in the ability for patients around the world to receive these life-changing therapies at a lower cost, because that's what it's all about. So with that, I'd like to say a thank you to Amanda. Thanks, Laura. And thanks to everyone for listening. Speak to you all on the next Bioradiations podcast. Bye for now.